logging in also, you can start the class. Okay, thank you. Om Jnana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Jaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Precharine Nirvishesha Shunyabadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vanchakalpata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevata Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So we welcome everyone to our ongoing study of Srimad Bhagavatam. And we are on Canto 6. And this evening we're looking at chapter number 17, where Parvati curses Chitraketu. And this is, of course, at the level of bhakti by bhav. Okay, so in the last chapter, just to review what was discussed a little bit, in the last chapter we heard how Maharaj Chitraketu had become relieved from his attachment to have a son. And of course, he got the son, but then the son died, and it was an extremely painful situation for him and the, all the family and relatives. But by the grace of Narada Muni and Angira Muni, they were able to relieve him from all this distress and the, the feeling of loss of the child. So this detachment which was created in the mind of Maharaj Chitraketu made him more qualified for devotional service. Add, don't take anything out, just add them up. So he was ready for devotional service, and so uh, this this is an, an important point. And Prabhupada talks about how the path of bhakti yoga is parallel with vairagya vidya, that there has to be that detachment there in order to do effective bhakti yoga. So Maharaj Chitraketu was given the mantra by Narada Muni and he chanted the mantra for seven nights, fasting, drinking only water for seven nights. And at the end of seven nights he had darshan of Lord Sankarshan. And we heard the prayers which he offered to Lord Sankarshan and we heard also Lord Sankarshan's reply to Maharaj Chitraketu. The essence of his prayers, of course, was the power of devotional service and the chanting of the holy name. So Maharaj Chitraketu was then rewarded. He became the king of the Vijadharas. He was given such an opulent position.
Of course, he was he was already the king of the Vijayadharas when he met with Lord Sankashan. So we're going on to chapter 17, and it begins with uh, Maharaj Chitraketu traveling. We're told he was given an aeroplane by Lord Vishnu, and he was able to use that aeroplane to travel. And we're told how he traveled in text number one. Do you want to see the text or do you all have your own text? You, you all have your own text, right? Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj, we have text, but uh, we, uh, you have highlighted points and also that will really help us. Okay, okay, then I'll share the screen. Yeah. I just wanted to know about that. Uh, let's see. How do. Versus. Um, Finally. I think I need to sign I need to sign out and sign back in again. Okay, Maharaj. I'm not I'm not able to Oh now it's come. Okay, here it is. Yeah. This is what I was looking for. <laughs> I couldn't find it. Okay, can you see the text all right? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so chapter 17 begins, Sukadeva Goswami describing how Maharaj Chitra Ketu had been given a wonderful aeroplane and he's traveling in outer space as the head of the Vijadharas. And then we're told how when he was traveling that he was going to these wonderful places, the valleys of the Sumeru mountain, which is a place where all great yogis would go. And he, was, he wasn't traveling alone, but he was traveling in the company of so many beautiful women from the Vijayadara Loka. But at the same time, we're told he was also chanting the glories of the Supreme Lord Hari. So this is very interesting. The Maharaj Chitraketu, remember previously when he was king of the Surasena, 
kingdom. At that time he had many wives, many, many wives. And here, now he's become head of the Vijadara Loka, and he's also got many beautiful women with him. So, it's surprising that although he has many beautiful women with him, he is chanting the glories of the Supreme Lord Hari. So Prabhupada explains here in the purport, just a short purport, we'll just read it here from the beginning. It is to be understood that Maharaj Chitraketu, although surrounded by many beautiful women from Vijadara Loka, did not forget to glorify the Lord by chanting the holy name of the Lord. It has been proved in many places that one who is not contaminated by any material condition, who is a pure devotee engaged in chanting the glories of the Lord, should be understood to be perfect. So this is certainly something quite challenging for our mind to consider like this, that this Maharaj Chit Chitraketu as the king of the Vijadharas, surrounded by beautiful women, and certainly they would be beautiful because they're from the upper regions of the plat of the universe, and the people there are much more beautiful than on our own planet. And so there he is with all these beautiful women, and they're traveling to these places as well, the valleys of the Sumeru mountain, which is also very beautiful. And <laughs> so, but Maharaj Chitraketu is traveling these places, but he's a pure devotee, and he's engaged in chanting the glories of the Lord. So he's understood to be perfect. So do we know any other people like this who would be, of course, well we're going to hear, of course, we're going to hear, similarly Lord Shiva is <laughs> in a similar situation. It's a challenging situation, yes? Uh, actually in third kind of Srimad Bhagavad also when they're talking about the Vaikuntan planets, they're telling the beautiful um, ladies and and uh, Vaikuntha are traveling, but they are not attracted by the physical features. Oh, okay, that's very nice. Thank you, Maharaji. Right. The ladies, although, well, the, in the higher planets, they are so attracted by the glories of the Lord, that although they have beautiful bodies, they are not attracted in Monday, they're not conditioned in any way by the material nature. They're not interested. Is this true also in the heavenly planets? Not just in the spiritual world. Huh? The demigods, when they came to watch Krishna, the demigods with their wives traveling in the airplanes, they would all be attracted by the beauty of Krishna. Okay, so in the higher planets it's understood that these people have more sense control than people on our planet. But we do hear a lot about demigods like Indra, sometimes he will have trouble controlling his senses. So it does, there are problems also in the higher planets. But here, Maharaj Chitraketu, he's remembering to chant the glories of the Lord. So because he's taking pleasure in the chanting of the holy name of the Lord, he's not interested in the pleasure of just the mundane association of women. So the association of the ladies is understood also, it's not really mundane, that they must have also been devotees because he was chanting the glories of the Lord, so they must have been happy to also hear the chanting of the glories of the Lord. So Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur points out in his commentary on this, that his enjoyment was in chanting the glories of the holy name of the Lord. 
His enjoyment was not in just being with the beautiful women, but his enjoyment was in chanting the holy name. Okay, so going ahead, we, we see here Maharaj Chitraketu traveling over uh, the different places in this wonderful aeroplane. And he, he sees Lord Shiva surrounded by Siddhas and Charanas and Lord Shiva sitting embracing Parvati. Parvati is sitting on his lap and he's embracing her and they're surrounded by Siddhas and Charanas. So great saintly persons are all there and they're listening to Lord Shiva and Lord Shiva is giving, maybe giving them a discourse, some kind of instruction. And Parvati is sitting on her lap, on his lap, and he's embracing her. And so when Chitraketu sees this, he laughs loudly, we're told. Laughed loudly and spoke within the hearing of Parvati. Right? So in the purport, Prabhupada said, there have been many instances in which a devotee acting as a demon has been brought to the kingdom of God by the mercy of the Lord, right? Well, so this is in relation to the fact that Parvati is going to curse Chitraketu to become Vitrasura. So then it's, it's brought up that there are, there are many instances in which a devotee acting as a demon is brought to the kingdom of God. What are some instances? Can you name some people, some different devotees? who were brought to the kingdom of God in demon body, uh, uh, they became demons and then they got liberated? Jai Vijay Maharaj? Jai Vijay, okay. But Jai Vijay, of course, they became, yeah, they became demons, right? They had to take three births as demons and then they could go back to the spiritual world, okay? So, Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, can we uh, tell Vibhishana he was also born in the demonic family? Vibhishana, uh, well, he was born in a demonic family. It didn't mean he was actually ever really a demon. Demon by birth, yeah, but didn't have demonic qualities, right? He was a devotee. He came to join. Anyway, certainly an interesting example. He was born in the demon family, but he gave up Lord Rama's association. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Vritrasura? Vritrasura, yeah. We're hearing about him, right? He's the one under discussion, yeah. Because Chitraketu becomes Vritrasura, and then he gets liberated. Guru Maharaj, there is this uh, example of Narad Muni telling somebody who was not convinced to take Krishna consciousness that, okay, when you are gone to Yamraj, just ask him what is the benefit of a moment's association with the devotee. And then uh, he was taken to Vaikuntha and I, I, I don't recollect the name of this person. But... Amrish Maharaj, brother. Yeah. yeah. So then that way, by questioning that, he was able to enter and then... Okay, yeah, very nice. Prahlad Maharaj? Mm, Prahlad Maharaj, he, again, you know, he's born in a demon family, but he's born as a great devotee, right? But we're talking about people who are devotees who are becoming demons and then they go back to Godhead from the demon condition. We see for in Krishna Leela, Krishna kills some demons, right? In Krishna Leela. Yeah, mostly all were devotees, no? Yeah, mostly all these demons who Krishna killed, they were devotees. Putana. And Bakasura, and Kamsa, <laughs> even Kamsa gets liberated. 
Bakasura, Agasura, mm. Pandraka. <laughs> they all went back to Godhead. Okay, so it, it's quite a common thing here. By the mercy of Krishna. But, yes? Uh, no. Yes, you have a doubt? Kamsa is, uh, Kamsa is not a demon now. His activities are demonic, but he is not from demonic family. Well, certainly his actions were all demonic, right? Yeah, his actions were demonic, and he was associating with the demons all the time. You say he was not a demon, that wasn't it? You could say not a demon by birth, but in some ways he was a demon by birth because it. You know, his, his mother was raped, and that's how he was, he was born, that someone had raped Kamsa's mother. And so that when you have that kind of birth, it's not, you can't expect to get good quality, a good quality child. That's the point. Birth is the birth is very important. Certainly helps. All right, so we're here to tricate. We're taught this verse. Jiva Goswami quotes this verse, and he, he says that by bhakti you can get everything. So this is showing that by bhakti you can get everything. Just the Chitraketu's desire. What was Chitraketu's desire? It appears. What he wanted was to heaven. He wanted swark. He wanted to enjoy the heavenly planets. And that's maybe why he took his birth as the king of the Vijadharas. And he's traveling in the aeroplane with all the women and he's going to Mount Sumeru and enjoying these heavenly places. So by bhakti, although he has, he has great bhakti, he's a pure devotee, he got this position, he got this situation that for millions of years he's enjoying the heavenly planets and enjoying the, the life there in the heavenly planets. That was his, his, something of his desire. And Jiva Goswami also then gives the example about uh, Sukadeva Goswami, that Sukadeva Goswami had to be promised, he had to get Krishna's word that if you come out of the womb, you won't be affected by Maya. And that was the condition in which Sukadeva Goswami left his mother's womb, that he, he, wanted, he wanted liberation. He didn't want to be disturbed, to be caught by the material energy. And that was why he could... But, he got liberation and that liberation that helped him to go on and get more bhakti. So Jiva Goswami quoting this verse from this seventeenth chapter, he, he's quoting that to show that by bhakti you can get everything. You don't need to do anything else, you just need to do bhakti and you can get everything, whatever you want. Okay, then we hear about Lord uh, Chitraketu, he's explaining about Lord Shiva, why he laughed at Lord Shiva. And, but it, he, Chitraketu's uh, laughing at Lord Shiva, it, it's explained to us that it's being done in, in a nice way. It's like a joking which is taking place between Chitraketu and Lord Shiva. Because as, as we said, Chitraketu is coming with a lot of women. He's also with a lot of ladies with him. You know, and now Lord Shiva, he may be sitting there with his wife, embracing his wife, but Chitraketu is not without fault himself. So who is, who is Chitraketu? It, it's actually, so when, when Chitraketu laughs at Lord Shiva, it's done in a joking way, and, and we'll hear more. Anyway, Lord Shiva, Lord 
Chitragigu's criticism of, it's not really a criticism of Lord Shiva. That's the point which is made by the Acharyas. He's not criticizing Lord Shiva, but he's just surprised. He's just surprised about it. Why is he surprised? Why is Chitraketu surprised that this, to see Lord Shiva in this situation? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yeah, Hare Krishna. In fact, funny because in the midst of saintly persons and in such a sabha, he was a seated wife on his lap. That's why he prayed. Yes, generally. We consider, you know, Vedic culture is that the husband and wife, you know, they won't show that kind of intimacy in public. It's not really the culture, you know, for the man to be embracing his wife. All right, man can embrace his wife. That, that, that's in private, in their home, they can do like that out of public eye, but not in the public, it's not really quite proper, that the mood of pro what they call propriety, you know, stand, what is the proper standard of behavior for people, how they should act. So in the Vedic culture, it's like this, it's, it's not expected, but here is Lord Shiva, and of course, what is why particularly Lord Shiva? You know, Lord Shiva and his wife, are, they're not just ordinary people, they're not just common people. You know, common people, ordinary working people, you may expect that they're not so cultured, they're not so sense controlled or following behavior properly. But Lord Shiva, what is his position? How do we consider him? Maharaj? Yes? Uh, he is the spiritual master of uh, the people uh, who are following Vedic injunction. Yes. Yes, he is a spiritual and master. also in the verse it stated, Maharaj, uh, Dharmam Vakta. Uh, he, he is the uh, speaker of religion. Okay. Text, and actually, is it. Uh, there's one. There's one word that he's described as a brahmachari who never falls down. Gata, gata ri, Gata ri. Loka guru Maharaj? Huh? Loka guru? A loka guru, the, the guru of the world, yes. Mm -hmm. But there's another word which is mentioned there, I was just reading, uh, where he's described as a brahmachari who never falls down. Way, but there was one word Prabhupada mentioned like that, which it, it, the literal meaning of the word is that he's a, a brahmachari who never falls down. So he's mentioned like that. He's a very, he's, in other words, he's a, he's a great soul that he's surrounded by all of these other persons and he's sitting there with his wife. But the surprising thing is that they're very intimately connected with each other. He's embracing her and generally Lord Shiva's naked as well. So it's certainly, in some ways, Chitraketu appreciates that Lord Shiva is very great, that he's very sense-controlled that he can be with his wife in such a situation and he's not agitated. 
he's not become he's not becoming sexually disturbed in the contact with his wife he she can be there and she can be embracing him and he's still quite happy to sit there in front of the sages and speak and so he is really dira this is lord shiva he is very sober and very sense controlled even when he's in this situation with his wife any ordinary person would be disturbed but lord shiva because he is so great because he's such an elevated he's not disturbed so this was a great wonder for chitraketu he was appreciating that that wow lord shiva is so amazing you know that he can be in this situation and he doesn't get disturbed so maharaj chitraketu in laughing to about lord shiva and it was not meant as a criticism that's a point now who did criticize lord shiva daksha yes daksha criticized lord shiva right what did he do he actually uh, offended uh, lord shiva how he didn't give a place for him in the yagya guru maharaj there was no seat for uh, Shiva and also he blasphemed Lord Shiva. Yeah, he di he didn't allow Lord Shiva to accept any of the offerings or the ablations. They didn't recite his name when they were offering the ablation. Usually they would always offer ablations to the different devas, but they didn't offer anything to Lord Shiva. And he just minimi totally minimized the position of Lord Shiva. and describing him as being insignificant not not important so chitraketu he didn't have that mode but daksha he was really offensive right we you earlier on in this canto you studied ajamil now ajamila was he ever offensive he was sinful he was sinful but he was not offensive you know he was just sinful he was uncontrolled in his senses but he was he was never actually offensive to any great personality like daksha was so similarly maharaj chitraketu he's not been offensive to lord shiva he was just surprised he was expressing his wonder about the position of lord shiva and he was appreciating in some he was appreciating his greatness that he could be in that situation and not disturbed because after all lord shiva is the spiritual master of so many other persons he's a very he's a uh is the god of the material world you could say and he's so renounced his hair is all matted so uh so uh let's see going on text number 8 describes chitraketu appreciated how great lord shiva was to be unaffected even in that situation therefore chitraketu was not an, an offender he merely expressed his wonder okay so sukadev goswami continues Lord Shiva the most powerful personality whose knowledge is fathomless simply smiled and remained silent and all the members of the assembly followed the lord by not saying anything so this is another interesting point in favor of maharaj chitraketu 
that if Maharaj Chitraketu had actually been offensive, then certainly all of these great souls and sages who were sitting there with Lord Shiva, they would have got up and left. They wouldn't have stayed around to hear offences. If Maharaj Chitraketu was, had actually been offensive, they would have immediately left that place because it's not proper to ever hear a great soul offended. And if we stay and hear a great soul offended, then we become offensive also. Is that how we're, Lord Shiva, he, he's not disturbed hearing Maharaj Chitraketu's comment. And the other sages, they're also not disturbed. They also don't say anything. Okay, so reading the, from the purport, Srila Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur, however, has made the following observation. Lord Shiva, being the most exalted Vaishnava and one of the most powerful demigods, is able to do anything that he desires. Although he was externally exhibiting the behavior of a common man and not following etiquette, such actions cannot diminish his exalted position. So this is supporting the position of Lord Shiva, that Lord Shiva is not at all a common man. However, the problem is that because he's not, an, because he's not a common man, as Prabhupada points out, or as Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur has pointed out in his commentary, which is translated for us by Srila Prabhupada, that as a great soul, he has to set the proper standard for others because the tendency will be there for people to follow. And we do see people following something of the behavior of Lord Shiva. We see sometimes, you know, people like the Naga Babas, you know, they, they can also go naked and they can, they will also be like Lord Shiva and smoke ganja and do these kind of things. So there are people who like to imitate these things without actually having the qualification of Lord Shiva, without actually having that sense control. So, Purport says, King Chitraketu desired that Lord Shiva cease this eternal behavior so that others might be saved from criticizing him and thus becoming offenders. So there would be two tendencies. Some people would follow the example of Lord Shiva, although not having the qualification, and other people, they will criticize Lord Shiva. So both people become offenders. Both kinds of conditions would become offensive. And if you offend Lord Shiva, then very bad, right? An offense against a great Vaishnava, then that is the mad elephant offense and it can destroy all the creepers of devotion. So we have to be very careful to never offend a Vaishnava. So as mentioned here in the purport, however, uh, King Chitraketu was somewhat harsh in his behavior with Lord Shiva. Somewhat harsh because he laughed loudly. He made a big thing about it in front of everyone laughing so everyone could hear. Now he didn't have to do like that but somehow by the will of providence it happened. Uh, Lord Shiva however, he's not disturbed. He can tolerate it. He's a great devotee. Hmm. So the others, they're all, they're not disturbed. Not going ahead, text number 10. 
the prowess, not knowing the prowess of Lord Shiva and Parvati, Chitraketu criticized them. His statements were not at all pleasing, and therefore the goddess Parvati, being very angry, spoke as follows to Chitraketu, who thought himself better than Lord Shiva in controlling the senses. So these are the words of Sukadeva Goswami. But Sukadeva Goswami describes the situation like this. However, Prabhupada's purport's a little mi milder. Although Sukadeva Goswami, it appears that he describes Madras Chitraketu as being strongly critical, Prabhupada said, although Chitraketu never meant to insult Lord Shiva, he should not have criticized the Lord even though the Lord was transgressing social customs. It is said, Dejasim na doshaya, one who is very powerful should be understood to be faultless. For example, one should not find faults with the sun, although it evaporates urine from the street. Going ahead, the difficulty was that Chitraketu, having become a great devotee of Lord Vishnu, Sankarshan, was somewhat proud at having achieved Lord Sankarshan's favour and therefore thought he could now criticise anyone, even Lord Shiva. This kind of pride in a devotee is never tolerated. A Vaishnava should always remain very humble and meek and offer respects to others. So we are seeing uh, the fault. Prabhupada is, through this purport, he is revealing to us what was the fault in the behaviour of Chitra Ketu, that he had this, this little trace of pride within his own nature. So that's recognisable from the fact that he's uh, with so many other ladies. You'll remember another person who also became proud in the company of ladies and who began to chant the glories of the demigods and ultimately got cursed by the Prajapatis. Right. Yes. Narada Muni's previous birth, he was a, a, a Gandharva. He was very handsome and he had a beautiful voice and he was in the company of many beautiful women and they were going to different places in the heavenly planets and he jokingly chanted the names of the demigods. So the Prajapatis cursed him to become humble. So pride is a very dangerous thing. We say, Prabhupada used to quote the saying, pride comes before the fall. We become proud and then Krishna takes it away. And Prabhupada also told that story, Punar Mushtika Baba, which you will all know about the mouse becoming a cat and then a dog and then a tiger, but then as a tiger he wanted to eat the yogi, so then the yogi told him, again become a mouse. So like that, pride. Who else was proud? Who else was proud and, be, and had to be cursed to take away their pride? There are many examples. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Nal Kuvera. Yeah, that's the obvious one, right? The two sons of Kuvera, Nala Kuvera and Mani Griva. They were very, because their father is Kuvera, very wealthy, become very proud and they become intoxicated and sinful 
So Narada Muni cursed them to become trees, to purify them. Yeah? All right? So, important humility. Don't become affected by the material situation. At the same time, we understand Maharaj Chitraketu is a very, very advanced devotee. So it must have been just only a slight trace of pride. But to go back to Godhead, you have to get rid of all of these things. That's important. So Lord Shiva, he's a great controller of the senses, and Maharaj Chitraketu, he's also a great devotee, he's a great yogi, he's also got control of the senses. So who's greatest? Certainly Maharaj Chitraketu, one should not think one's better than another. You shouldn't, you should never practice this. A Vaishnava should not try to minimize anyone else's position. It is always better to maintain humility and meekness and chant the Hare Krishna mantra. The word Nirjit Atma Bhimanina indicates that Chidraketu thought himself a better controller of the senses than Lord Shiva although actually he was not. Because of all these considerations, Mother Parvati was somewhat angry at Chitraketu. Now naturally Parvati is going to, she's, a, she's the most chaste of all wives, so she's very faithful to her husband and anybody who criticizes her husband, is very, she takes it very seriously. So, we hear Mother Parvati's criticism and she's really upset, she's really quite angry and she lays into this Chitraketu and said, Alas, has this upstart now received a post from which to punish shameless persons like us? Has he been appointed ruler, carrier of the rod of punishment? Is he now the only master of everything? Wow, she can really be heavy. We can, you know, she's the mother of the universe. And, she, you know, she can really be the mother. So, as mother, we see the mother always has to look after her children. So, Chitraketu is like one of her children. And, you know, mother, when she sees the child doing something wrong, then she's going to correct the child. So Mother Parvati is not wrong really in issuing her curse because it's her duty as her mother to check the, the, the behavior, to check the actions of her, her children, those who are under her jurisdiction. So anyway, she, she talks about uh, she mentions the names of so many great personalities and she's, she says, I suppose it to be because of this that they have not tried to stop Lord Shiva from behaving improperly. That there's so many great personalities, they never found any fault with Lord Shiva. How, how is it you're finding fault with Lord Shiva? The four Kumaras, Lord Brahma, Lord Kapila, Manu, none of them found any fault with Lord Shiva. Who are you that you find fault? You have something to criticize Lord Shiva. So this, this is a very powerful argument. And then she said, this, this Chitraketu is the lowest of Kshatriyas. Yeah, he's a Kshatriya, he's a Kshatriya king. So he's a Kshatriya, he's not a Brahmin. And he has overridden Brahma and the other demigods, insulting Lord Shiva. So, 
she, before she issues her curse, she first of all explains why or what is the fault with this Chitra Ketu's behavior. And now she's coming, next point, text number 14, she describes about the pride of Chitra Ketu. That he's thinking, I am the best. So Parvati, Mother Parvati said, he does not deserve to approach the shelter of Lord Vishnu's lotus feet. He is impudent, thinking himself greatly important. This is an important instruction coming from Mother Parvati describing the importance for a, a devotee that all devotees have to have the quality of humility. We have to consider ourselves unworthy, unqualified. And Prabhupada quotes Shikshastikam at the end of the purport, unless one is humble and meek, one cannot qualify to sit at the lotus feet of the Lord. So Chitraketu is con uh, being criticized like this by Mother Parvati. So then takes 15, she issues her curse. And she said, Oh, impudent one, my dear son, right? Mother Parvati, we said, the mother of the universe. So mother has the right to punish the child. When the child misbehaves, mother has to do something. She has to take some action. And, and Prabhupada tells us, he said, just like in Krishna Leela, we see even Mother Yashoda, that she had a stake, and Krishna was really afraid of the stake. He has to tell Mother Yashoda, put down your stake and then I'll come. I'm, I'm. Krishna was very afraid seeing Mother Yashoda carry her stake. And Mother Yashoda ties up Krishna also to stop his misbehavior. So even Mother Yashoda, she would also punish Krishna a little bit. So Mother Parvati, she's going to punish her son. And she tells, now take birth in a low, sinful family of demons, so that you will not commit such an offence again towards exalted, saintly persons in this world. And so it's interesting that how is it possible he could take birth in a family of demons but he's not going to commit sins against saintly persons. We think, well, if he takes birth in a family of demons, he'll become more sinful. But we should understand the, uh, the, the situation that because Chitraketu has bhakti, that bhakti cannot be lost. That bhakti will go with him to the demon birth. And although he becomes Vritasura, he doesn't lose his bhakti. So although he's born with the demon body, he's always transcendentally situated. He's not like a, a normal demon. He's a great devotee, but he's in the demon body. So he kept his Vaishnava qualities, his devotee qualities. Just a few points from the purport. Uh, a pure Vaishnava should be very careful to engage in his specific duty without criticizing others. This is the safest position. Otherwise, if, you, if one tends to criticize others, he may commit the great offense of criticizing a Vaishnava. So, as we said, that's a Hatimata, the mad elephant offense, which destroys everything in the garden. And as soon as there is a small discrepancy in a demon's behavior, Mother Parvati or Durga immediately punishes the demon so that he may come to his senses.
So this is what's happened. Mother Durga has punished Chitra Ketu that he will come to his senses. So then Prabhupada quotes Devi Hesha Gunamayi and he says, to surrender to Krishna means to surrender to his devotee also, for no one can be a proper servant of Krishna unless he is a proper servant of a devotee. So serving the devotee is very, very powerful, take up the service of the devotee. Thus it is the duty of a mother to chastise her beloved son, even in the case of the Supreme Lord. Mother Durga was justified in punishing Chitraketu. This punishment was a boon to Chitraketu because after taking birth as a demon, Vritasura, he was promoted directly to Vaikuntha. So this is the plan that this whole thing, this cursing of Chitraketu has been arranged by the Supreme Lord to accelerate Chitraketu's progress back to Godhead. Because if Chitraketu remains simply the king of the Vijadharas, just simply enjoying traveling in the heavenly planets, as we heard, he was traveling for millions of years like that, enjoying. So it could go on forever, but the Lord wants to accelerate him coming back to Godhead. So it has been arranged. Mother Parvati cursing Chitraketu so that he can come quickly back to Godhead. So Sukadeva Goswami continues, what, how does Chitraketu react to the curse? How would we like it, you know, to be cursed? Maharaj Chitraketu is, yeah, as Chitraketu he's experienced so many things that he was a king and he had millions of wives but no son. And then he got the benediction and he had a son, but then the son died. So you can see what's the roller coaster of life, the up and the down, the good and the bad. He's a king, but then no son. And then he gets a son, then the son dies. And then he gets Narada and Angira and they're instructing him. And then he becomes the king of the Vijadharas and he's traveling and enjoying. And now he's cursed to become a demon. So what does he think? What does he think? Maharaj, he is not disturbed uh, because uh, he very well knew that one suffering and he enjoys many of results of one's past deeds are ordained by the Supreme Lord, mm. or agent of the Supreme Lord. Yeah, the, there, there was one devotee, uh, he, an American devotee, he, he was on the Brajaman, uh, uh, yeah, Brajaman, Brajaman Parikrama, and he was walking there one morning, he was in the fields and he was going to answer nature's call. and. There were some men, as he was walking through the field, it was, you know, early morning, dark. So the, some local villagers shouted at him, but he didn't pay any attention to them. And he kept walking and he fell into the well. He fell into a well in the middle of the field. And so this, he was a very big, heavy body devotee, you know, he's not a small man, he was heavily built, quite overweight actually. So he fell into the well, oh my goodness, and uh, he, 
it was he was bad, quite badly injured. It took some time to get him out because he was so heavy. Somehow they managed to get him out, and he was on crutches for a long time. He recovered now, but. He said at the time, when he fell into the well, when he was in the, that well, he thought, he was just thinking to himself, oh, here we go again. I've been through all this before. You know, he'd been injured before. He'd been in these kind of difficult situations. He just kind of accepted it. Just like we see here, Maharaj Chitraketu, that he's cursed, you know, and, and that it's not a very nice curse. It's quite a heavy curse. But okay, what does he do? He gets out of his airplane and he comes and he offers his obeisances to Mother Parva. And we're going to hear how he addresses her, what he has to say. Hmm? So, you know. People would react when you get cursed. You generally, what we would think we would say, "Oh no, please don't curse me!" Oh, please, you know, like when Yayati was cursed by Sukracharya to become old, then he pleaded, "Oh no, don't do this to me. It won't be good. It will affect your daughter." Like this, you know, find some way to get out of the curse. And who else, who else was cursed and he tried to, he wanted to get out of it, he asked for some condition, he asked for some leniency. Can you think of some examples, other people being cursed? Maharaj, like uh, Chitra Ketu, Parikshit Maharaj also was cursed by Sringi, he also pleasantly accepted it. Yes, uh huh. Srini accept, uh, Maharaj Pariksit accepted the curse. He thought well and good because he understood there was some sin on his part, it was a minor offense, but he tolerated it. And he, but when he heard news of the curse, he thought, yes, it is proper, well and good, and he accepted it and he prepared for his end. Mm -hmm. But he, he, he did, he, there were sometimes you get people who were cursed, they tried to avoid it and they would ask for some, you know, kind of reprieve or a change or some, or a special concession. Yes? Maharaj, even when he was cursed, he was cursed by Manikriva and Manakuvera. Manikriva and Manakuvera, yes. They were cursed to become trees, but they had the special benediction that Lord Krishna, they would remain as trees until Lord Krishna came there to deliver them. So that was a, a great blessing for them, that the curse of Narada Muni is really a blessing, that they will get the darshan of Lord Krishna and he will come and relieve them of their curse. Uh huh. Maharaj, your uh, laptop battery is uh, going down. Oh, thank you, Prabhu. Okay. Yeah. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yes. Can we say the uh, curse given by four Kumaras to uh, Jaya and Vijaya? Okay. Yes. They were given the choice, either seven births as devotees or three births as demons. So they thought better to take three births as demons and we can come back quicker. Maharaj, please uh, correct me. Uh, even Gandhari had cursed uh, Krishna, right? Did she? What was the curse? And, uh, I, I missed somewhere in between. Uh, when uh, when she had called uh, Duryodhan quietly and she uh, you know wanted to see him uh, and 
fold her uh, you know uh, blindness and then uh, she wanted to bless she said i have never ever uh, after marriage never opened my eyes and seen this world so she wanted to pass on uh, blessings to duryodhan as something like that marriage please uh, and let us see if it is uh, correct or wrong yeah, she wanted to look on his body to make his body very powerful and strong that it couldn't be damaged couldn't be broken yeah, yeah. and uh, because of krishna that couldn't happen right. that's the reason uh, she cursed uh, krishna but what, what, what I, I, I never heard the curse before, I didn't hear this part before. I knew about the Duryodhana and Gandhari and she was going to open her eyes and look on his body, but Krishna told him, don't go naked like that, put some cloth on. So he came before her, he was covered with cloth, right? He, that his private parts were covered with cloth. And so she was disappointed when he came like that that you know she said i told you to come naked and he said oh krishna met me and he told me i had to cover myself so i don't know maybe it's possible that gandhari had cursed krishna because of this of course ultimately this was the cause of duryodhana's death that mm. hit him at that part where he was vulnerable mm. yeah but I, I never heard about the curse on Krishna from Gandhari. Okay, Maharaj. Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh -huh. Even Brigumuni curses uh, Brahma and uh, Shiva also. Did he? Brigumuni. Oh, he curses Brahma and Shiva. Can you tell me what happened? Brigumuni, he was uh, very, always uh, very, uh, he is having the nature of cursing, he is having always with anger. So when he comes to uh, Brahma Loka, Brahma will not, uh, Brahma will be in meditation and uh, so he will uh, not receive uh, Brigumuni, the sage Brigu, uh, properly. So he will uh, curse him, uh, telling uh, in the all three words, uh, you will, your puja will not happen. Nobody cannot do any devotion to you. No temple. Oh, really? And, I ne uh, never heard this before. Yeah. And again, he will go to Kailasa. There also, Shiva, he will be with uh, Parvati. And uh, uh, there also, he will not agree, invite uh, uh, Brigu Muni properly. So there also, he will get cursed by Brigu Muni saying, uh, your uh, puja will not happen, but uh, then uh, he will say only in linga rupa. So only in linga form, all devotees can do puja for you. But somehow he will come to Vaikuntha, there uh, Narayana, he will, uh, with uh, very tactically, he will uh, invite him and he will, uh, uh, in, uh, he will do, but still, uh, uh, there also he will, uh, with the angry, he will uh, uh, put his leg on uh, Vakshastara of uh, Narayana. So Lakshmi will be very much, uh, she was very upset with uh, that and uh, she will leave Vaikuntha at that time. But uh, with uh, tactically, he will remove the third eye from the foot of the sage Prabhu Narayana. I don't know where you get this story from, but you know, we have a story about Brigo in, in Srimad Bhagavatam that tells how he went to Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. He was to test which one was the greatest and he went to Brahma. Brahma is like his father. Brahma is the father of Brigo. So this is how it's told in our book, you know, Prabhupada's book, that, he, that Brigo is like the son of Brahma, and he came to Brahma, but he didn't offer respects. So Brahma was a little, was angry, but he con controlled the anger. And then he went to see Lord Shiva, and Lord Shiva is, he was born from Lord Brahma, from the anger of Brahma, from the forehead of Brahma, Lord Rudra comes out. 
So when he went to see Lord Shiva, Lord Shiva is like a brother of Brigo, and Lord Shiva came to embrace him. But Brigo said, don't touch me, you've got all these ashes on you, and you've got snakes on your body, I don't want you to touch me. So Lord Shiva got angry at him. He got really angry. And Mother Parvati had to come and restrain her husband, and Brigo left. And then he went to see Vishnu, and then he kicked Vishnu. And it was at that time Lakshmi cursed the Brahmanas that they'll never have any wealth. And so Lord Vishnu, when he was kicked by Brigo, Lord Vishnu got up and said, Oh, I'm sorry, I hope you haven't hurt your foot on my hard chest. So Brigo was very impressed at the nature of Lord Vishnu that he was so equipoise, undisturbed. So Brahma is in charge of the mode of passion and Lord Shiva is in charge of the mode of ignorance, but Vishnu is in charge of the mode of goodness. So this is how it's told in Srimad Bhagavatam. It may be... Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. I have one question related to this, can I ask? Yeah. But in this situation, we see in the condition of uh, Chitra Ketu when he laughed, Mara, Lord Shiva was completely equipoised, he did not get disturbed. And even though he uh, like uh, did the mockery or he laughed, but in the case of Bhrigu Muni, uh, it's it just that he did not embrace him, Lord Shiva became angry. So how do we understand these two situations? Well. Lord Shiva didn't, he didn't, they didn't embrace each other because he, Lord Shiva's already embracing the, his, with his wife. He's not going to get up and put down his wife and go and embrace Chitra Ketu. And, and there may be, maybe they're not familiar with each other. I don't know how well Chitra Ketu knew each other. He hadn't met Lord Shiva before. They don't seem to have a relationship. My question is that, not that, my question is that he laughed, Chitra Ketu laughed and he did not become angry, but he did not embrace and then that time he became angry. Who did not embrace? Uh, like uh, Bhrigurishi when he came, he wanted to embrace Bhrigurishi and he refused to be embraced by Lord Shiva and he said you are having the, uh, that, uh, that, all the dust of the uh, crematorium and all. So that time he became angry, and this time when he was uh, Chitraketu laughed, he did not become angry. Yes, right. Uh, well, it's a different situation. Brigamuni is coming. He's a brother, the brother of Lord Shiva. So they're intimately connected, the, the brothers expect to embrace each other. And Brigo was testing, the, the purpose, directly insulting Lord Shiva. As we heard, Chitra Ketu is not, he's not insulting Lord Shiva. He's not really criticized. He was just surprised. It was just, it was just, some, it was some kind of, un, something he didn't expect from Lord Shiva. But it wasn't actually a criticism. And that this point is going to come out. The Chitraketu said, "Well, he's going to tell Mother Parvati that, you know, I'm sorry that you got offended, but actually I, I didn't mean to." Make, make anybody angry. I didn't mean to make anybody angry. I didn't mean to upset you. I'm sorry you've taken it like that. Anyway, Chitra Ketu accepts it as the will of providence. But Brigamuni, when Brigamuni is coming there to test, you know, he, he wants to make them angry. He wants to make Lord Shiva angry. It's like that, right? Okay, Maharaj. Yes, thank you. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, can we uh, 
say regarding about the curse that Arjuna got from Urvashi? Yes, Arjuna got cursed to become a eunuch for one year, right? Yes, Maharaj. He didn't respond, Maharaj. He yeah. also took it calmly. He took it calmly, yeah. He understood, I'll make use of this, this will be useful to me sometime. And it was. And so devotees should be like that when we get cursed. We, thank you. One devotee was distributing books. You know, in, in America, in Prabhupada's time, I remember, a devotee was distributing books in the airport in those days, and we used to be able to go into the airports and we would distribute books there. So one devotee was distributing books there in the airport. And so one day he offered a book to a man, and the man didn't take the book, the man just punched him in the face. You know, sometimes people are like that, they're very aggressive, very passionate. And so the man who punched him in the face, what did the devotee do? Now the devotee was distributing books, he could have retaliated. He was not a weakling, he was a powerfully built young man and he could have, he could have taken, he could have had a physical contact with the man. But what did he do? The devotee just simply thought, thank you Krishna. Thank you, Krishna. So sometimes like that, you have to be able to tolerate these situations. It's not easy, it's a test. But see it coming from Krishna. And Chitraketu, we will hear how he's taking the, this curse. He's accepting that this is also the, the plan of the Supreme Lord. We have to see that. The, this, this is ordained by the will of providence. It was ordained, it had to happen like... Mother Parvati, it's not her fault. She's just an instrument in the service of the Lord. That she's doing the... her putting the curse on Chitraketu was the arrangement of the Lord. The Lord used her to put this... <laughs> and we will hear how later on she feels ashamed, she feels guilty that she should. But actually it was all just the arrangement of the Lord. So Maharaj Chitraketu is responding to the curse. My dear mother, with my own hands folded together, I accept the curse upon me. I do not mind the curse. No, that's really surprising, you know. Other people, they oh no, please don't curse me, oh no. Yeah. Find some, can somebody else take the curse? Can I give the curse to my son? <laughs> like that, we want to pass off the curse or try to minimize it. Prabhupada writes, he knew, he knew, Maharaj Chitraketu knew that he had not committed any offence at the lotus feet of Lord Shiva or the goddess Parvati, yet he was being punished. And this means that the, the punishment had, had been ordained. Thus the king did not mind it. A devotee is naturally so humble and meek that he accepts any condition of life. And, and Prabhupada then says, suffering therefore is also a process of purification. <laughs> we have to remember that next time we're suffering, that this is our, for our purification. So therefore devotees volunt voluntarily undergo some austerity. They voluntarily accept some austerity because they see it as a purification. And with purifi as we get purified, then we, we become more qualified to go back to Godhead. At the end of the purport, Prabhupada writes, acting through the heart of Parvati, the Lord who is situated in everyone's heart, 
curse Chitraketu in order to end all his material reactions. So it was the Lord himself who cursed Chitraketu by acting through the heart of Mother Parvati. And then Chitraketu describes the nature of the material world. We're wandering, sometimes we're suffering, sometimes we're enjoying. It, we just go with the flow. That's what we say. You say, go with the flow, right? The flow of the material world. You come together, sometimes you're successful, and sometimes you're suffering. Sometimes you're rejoicing, sometimes you're lamenting. You have to take the good with the bad. You have to tolerate. And the Pur -pur -prab Prabhupada writes, to get free from the karma chakra, the wheel of the results of one's karma, one should take to bhakti yoga, devotional service of our Krishna consciousness. That is the only remedy, right? By devotional service, then we can destroy all the karma. So Maharaj Chitraketu, he doesn't really have karma. We should understand, it's not really his karma which is happening. Although a devotee will say like that, once those who are devoted, they say, oh, it's my karma, but actually it's the arrangement of Krishna. Krishna has arranged it to relieve us of our attachments, of our material desires. Krishna takes these things away from us by giving us some difficulties, by giving us so many troubles. So because of gross ignorance, however, the living entity thinks he and others are the cause. So this, this kind of ignorance, this is a problem. People are in ignorance about the material situation. We're thinking, oh, somebody did this to me, they did this, they, they gave me this problem, they took this from me. Actually, it's all karma, material energy. So Prabhupada writes in the purport, this ignorance continues very strongly in the mode of ignorance presented by material nature. One must therefore promote himself to the state of goodness through his character and behavior and then gradually come to the transcendental platform or ad hoc such a platform. So we have to come out of the modes of nature, we have to get free of the passion and ignorance. We have to come up to the mode of goodness and then we can transcend. And then he, he describes in text 20 about the river, the material world is like a river and the waves are coming, the water's flowing. Sometimes you come together, sometimes you're separated. We come together, we make our families, we have our children, relatives, and then it's all separated. We go different places, just like Maharaj Chitraketu. He, he has the experience, so much pleasure, then so much suffering, and then more pleasure, then more suffering. The roller coaster, the flow of the material world, so much anxiety. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur gives an example about the material world. He said, it is like being thrown into a mine of salt. If one falls into a mine of salt, he tastes only salt wherever he goes. So this material world is full of misery. The so-called temporary happiness of the world is also misery, but in ignorance 
we cannot understand this. Now, people are thinking happiness. When they get, they may get money, they get wealth, or they get a son, or they get some success, mater their material desires are fulfilled. It just means more misery, more suffering, more attachment to the material world. It doesn't solve the problems. So Maharaj Chitraketu goes on to speak about the Supreme Lord, how He is one and how He is arranged for everyone. Everyone's happiness and distress is under His, uh, his control ultimately. So the material, we're under, under the material energy, we're put into ignorance and we experience all the difficulties. Sometimes by knowledge we're given liberation. We're trying to escape from all the miseries of the material world. And Maharaj Chitraketu then goes on to speak about the impartiality of the Supreme Lord. As Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, I, am equal, I envy no one, I am equal to everyone. But whoever is a friend who is in me, I am in him and he is in me. So Krishna has some, definitely has partiality towards his devotees, but he is equal to everyone. The example is given about the judge. In the high court, the judge may award, reward someone and he may punish someone else. But the judge is not partial to someone. The judge is equal to everyone. He just has to award people according to their actions. So the, the Supreme Lord is not, he, he, he's not thinking just simply who you are, but he, he looks at the work, what you've done. Another example given in this regard are the lilies open or close because of the, sh the sunshine. And thus the bumblebees enjoy or suffer. But the sunshine and the sun globe are not responsible for the happiness and distress of the bumblebees. So the same way, Krishna is not responsible for the suffering and the happiness of the parts and parcel living entities. It's all our own doing. Sometimes we get good fortune, sometimes we get distress. We get the results of our own activities. Chitraketu continues, he says, O oh Mother, you are now unnecessarily angry. Chitraketu recognizes his relationship with Parvati, describes her as mother. But, but he says, happiness and distress are just destined by my past activities. I do not plead to be excused or relieved from your curse. Although what I have said is not wrong, please let whatever you think is wrong be pardoned. So in this way Maharaj Chitraketu is asking Par Mother Parvati to forgive him, to overlook his, to pardon his offences. At the same time he tells her, first of all, I, 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 I accept the curse, you don't have to worry, I'll take the curse. You have cursed me like that, I accept it. But uh, it will be better if you don't hold a grudge against me and thinking that I did something wrong. And Prabhupada explains, being fully aware of how the results of one's karma accrue by the laws of nature, Chitra Ketu did not want to be released from Parvati's curse. 
Nonetheless, he wanted to satisfy her, because although his verdict was natural, she was displeased with him. So as a result, as a matter of course, Chitraketu begged pardon from Parvati. It is proper, if somebody thinks, and Prabhupada explains like that, if someone thinks we have offended them, then it's the proper thing to do is to apologize that, I'm sorry, I didn't have any intention to offend you. If you have taken offense from me, then I will, please forgive me. Please uh, excuse me, excuse me if I've offended you. So this is proper. So Maharaj Chitraketu is explaining like this to Mother Parvati. Uh, Parvati, and, and then Maharaj Chitraketu, he's apologized and he's asked Parvati to forgive him and he gets in the aeroplane and he goes. And so Shiva and Parvati are left and they see how Chitraketu is unafraid and they're described as being astonished by his behavior. So they, they're really astonished that this, this great king, and he, he's been cursed to become a demon and he's just accepted it and he's gone off. They're really surprised. So Lord Shiva is going to instruct his wife about the position of the Vaishnavas and the devotees of the Supreme Lord. Lord Shiva wants to, it's his duty, because as a husband, he's like the guru of his wife, so he has to guide her. And he will explain to Mother Parvati in a joking way, in a joking way, he says, my dear beautiful Parvati, <laughs> you know, he, he the, the wife wants to know she's beautiful, so he tells her, you're beautiful, but you don't have bhakti. You may have beauty, but you don't have bhakti, not like Chitraketu. You may be more beautiful than Chitraketu, but you don't have bhakti equal to Chitraketu. And it's bhakti which is the important thing. So Lord Shiva says to Parvati, this is the greatness of the Vaishnavas. They are great souls. They are not interested in any kind of material happiness. And so this is very rare, of course, in the material world. Everybody is interested in material happiness. But the devotees of the Lord, who have surrendered to the Lord, they're not worried. Prabhupada explains, of course Lord Shiva smiled when he joked with his wife in that way, for others cannot speak like that. The Supreme Shiva continued, is always exalted in his activities. And here is another example of his wonderful influence upon King Chitraketu, his devotee. So the King Maharaj, uh, Lord Shiva rather, is describing the greatness of the Supreme Lord and the greatness of the devotees of the Lord. Why is he great? Because I said to you, he did not say anything in retaliation. This is the excellence of a devotee. By mildly tolerating your curse, he has certainly excelled the glory of your beauty and your power to curse him. It's pointed out that when you curse someone, you curse someone, you want to cause them pain. You, your intention is to give them some kind of punishment. 
You want them to feel pain and, and discomfort. But we see with Maharaj Chitra Ketu, it didn't work like that. Because although he got cursed, he didn't feel any pain or discomfort. And so Maharaj uh, Parvati's curse was not effective because she couldn't cause any pain to him. Just like if the mother's going to beat the child, the child should feel the pain. But if the child just laughs when the mother hits him, then there's no point in beating the child. At the end of the purport, he indicated that although she was powerful, the king, without showing any power, had excelled her power by his tolerance. So Maharaj Chitra Ketu showed his tolerance, which was greater than his power, than, than the power of Mother Parvati, rather, that he tolerated. And we will hear later on, Maharaj Chitra Ketu could have counter-cursed Parvati, but he didn't do it. He could have used his own power to counter-curse her, but he accepted it. That is his greatness. So this is the tolerance of a devotee. Right. Sadhus are tolerant. Remember in Kapila Shiksha, the qualities of the sadhu? Tatikshava karunika, first quality, tolerance, right? So here we see a wonderful example of tolerance. Can you think of some other examples, great devotees who were very tolerant? What did they tolerate? Ambarish Maharaj. Ambarish Maharaj tolerated Dravasa Muni's anger. Yes. Good. Yes. Prahlad also was put into so many conditions, so many d very dangerous life, life-threatening conditions, and pra Prahlad tolerated everything. Srila Haridas Thakur, Guru Maharaj? Yes, Haridas Thakur was beaten 22 marketplaces, and he just smiled, and he didn't, and he asked the Lord, please don't harm the people who are beating me. Don't do anything to punish them. They're just doing their job. Maharaj Kunti and all the Pandavas. Okay, Maharaj, uh, Maharani Kunti and the Pandavas tolerated a lot of things. Their house set on fire, giving poison, and then the battle of Kurukshetra. Uh huh. Yes? Maharaj Bhishma Dev. Bhishma Dev tolerated what? The bed of arrows? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yeah. Maharaj, actually, even Parichit Maharaj, even though he is, he is blessed with the Lord, but he accepts the curse of the son of the Rishi. And then. Okay. Yes. Hare Krishna, Maharaj Duryodhana uh, cursed Vidura, mm. insulted him. Yeah, he threw him out of the palace. Yes. yes. That was. And a... uh, even Vidura, uh, Vidura uh, also uh, used harsh word to Dhritarashtra. Well, Vidura wanted Dhritarashtra to stop the war. He, he wanted him to, that they should give some land to the Pandavas so that they could rule. But Duryodhana also he was... Duryodhana didn't want Vidura to influence the mind of his father. Yes? And also once uh, Duryodhana uh, uses harsh words to uh, Dhritarashtra that, you know, why are you staying like a like a dog? You know, now you have to wind up. Who is this? Vidura uh, had uh, told this to. Rita Rashtra. Oh, yeah, to get out from the palace. Yes. Yes. Mm. 
Yes, okay. Maharaj, Nityananda Mahaprabhu tolerated Devagata. Okay, Nityananda was hit on the head and tolerated. I was thinking also the Avanti Brahman. Avanti Brahman was very tolerant. He had to get up. He was abused a lot. He tolerated it. He accepted it all as it, the arrangement of the Lord. Right? We say Tatena Kampam Susamikshamana. That this is really the qualification for the devotee, for devotional service. That we will tolerate all kinds of adverse conditions thinking them to be reactions due to our past deeds. So, uh, Maharaj, yes? Our dear Srila Prabhupada. Yes, what did he tolerate? Yeah, he tolerated all the atrocities of uh, uh, the, the hippies during the initial days of Krishna consciousness. Okay. And also he suffered uh, I know heart attack while while traveling. Yeah. So. Yes. Yeah, so all right. He tolerated a lot. Tolerated all the difficulties in India. Nobody would help him. Nobody wanted to support him. Nobody wanted to encourage him. So he went to the west, and he got people there to help. Hare Krishna Maharaj, even Prabhupada disciples, now they are taking this moment ahead. But they are also tolerating? Adversity. Who's, what, what's your example? Prabhupada's disciples? Yeah, Prabhupada disciples. They are being toler they're tolerating or they are being tolerated? <laughs> <laughs> they are tolerating us, Maharaj. <laughs> yeah, for those who are still on the planet, a lot of left. <laughs> Every day there's more and more leaving the planet. <laughs> there's only a few of them left nowadays. Okay. Uh, so, Prabhupada writes, Lord, Lord, describing that Lord Shiva is explaining to Mother Parvati the nature of these devotees of the Lord, how they, they don't fear any condition of life. A famous verse, Narayana Parasarvena Kachasthinyo Vibhyate. And Prabhupada says in the purport, they do not mind reverses in life because in the service of Narayan, they have learned to tolerate with whatever hardships there may be. You have to tolerate. You have to, it's, it's diff, this is expected for devotees. A devotee must be tolerant. <laughs> I was with the, what, the devotees one time. I was in one country in Asia there, and we were out on Harinam chanting in the streets. And one devotee somehow he got in a fight with some other people on the street. And so I restrained him and I said, What are you doing? He said, I could not tolerate. <laughs> some people were saying something bad or something about devotees, and he started to fight with the man in the street. And so he said he couldn't tolerate. I said, No, come on, you devotees, we have to tolerate, we have to be tolerant. The example has to be shown, right? We have to show that example, tolerance, so important. So we see it's a wonderful example of tolerance here in Maharaj Chitra Ketu. And Lord Shiva is appreciating that and he's glorifying this to Parvati. He wants Mother Parvati to understand the position of these devotees, how they don't have any material desires. That they're indifferent to the situation of the material world. It's not important for them. They're only thinking what is important is to go back to Godhead, to be with the Lord, service to the Lord. So, 
Prabhupada is pointing out here. He writes here, by using the word Bridya Bridyanam, Lord Shiva points out that although Chitraketu provided one example of tolerance and excellence, all the devotees who have taken shelter of the Lord as eternal servants are glorious. They have no eagerness to be happy by being placed in the heavenly planets, becoming liberated or becoming one with Brahman, the, the supreme effulgence. These benefits do not appeal to their minds. They are simply interested in giving direct service to the Lord. And we saw this wonderfully in Srila Prabhupada. I remember uh, Prabhupada was in Hong Kong and the devotee in Hong Kong arranged Rolls Royce car to pick Prabhupada up from the airport and then they rented a beautiful penthouse suite in a big hotel in Hong Kong. Very, very expensive and Prabhupada was there for a few days and right after that Prabhupada came from there and he came to Bhubaneswar. And in those days, in Prabhupada's time, Bhubaneswar was just some mud hut, mud hut in some remote area in Bhubaneswar. Today it's much different, but in Prabhupada, when Prabhupada had gone there in 1977, it was just a mud hut. And Prabhupada came right from Hong Kong to the mud hut in Bhubaneswar. He didn't mind. No difference at all. Didn't make any difference. And Prabhupada was showing devotees, he said, you take the mud here, you don't need to buy soap, you just use this earth. He said, this clay soil here, you use it, you rub it on your body, very healthy. You get all the chemicals, all the minerals just from the soil. You know, nowadays people all buy different soaps. You go to people's homes and they have these liquids and they spend so much money and they, they have all these different containers and things with these liquid solutions and stuff which they put on their body and stuff for their hair and everything. But it's all there in nature. You just use the land. And Prabhupada was showing us. You just use this, you rub it on the body, very healthy. Just like in Mayapur, you go to Ganga, you take the mud from the bank of the Ganga, rub it on the body, very healthy, lay in the sun mud bath. People spend a fortune. They go to beauty parlors and they have these mud packs and everything. Spend a lot of money. You can do it all free. Go on the bank of the Ganga and just take the mud. So for the devotees of the Lord, they don't see any difference. Heaven or hell or liberation. It's all the same. What's important service, that we can do service for Krishna. So Lord Shiva speaking to Mother Parvati, instructing her about the glory of a devotee. It's, and he says, the dualities of happiness and distress or birth and death, curses and favours are just byproducts of this contact in the material world. What Parvati thinks is a curse is actually a blessing because it means that Maharaj Chitraketu is going to be able to get out of the material world and he's going to be able to go back to Godhead. He's going to get the association of Lord Sankarshan. So it's a blessing. So what we think is a curse is actually often a blessing. We have to know to see the hand of the Lord in everything which happens. And we have to surrender to the will of the Lord. Don't be attached. This is it. So this is a devotee who is Narayana Para. Narayana Para, the pure devotees, must be... Uh, those, those who are not Narayana Para pure devotees must be disturbed by this duality of the material world. Whereas devotees 
who are simply attached to the service of the Lord are not at all disturbed by it. And so it's important for us, keep the mind always controlled, be attached to Krishna and see everything is the arrangement of the Lord. This chapter is very, very instructive for us, it shows us the importance of controlling the mind and being detached from the material situations. Lord Shiva gives examples in text number 30. One mistakenly considers a flower garland to be a snake or experiences happiness and distress in a dream. So in the material world, by a lack of careful consideration, we differentiate between happiness and distress, considering one good, the other bad. We don't know what is really good. The nice verses there from Chaitanya Charitamrita in the purport. Dvaita Bhadra Bhadra Gyan Sap Manodham E Bala E Manda E Sapram. The mind, the Manodharm, the business of the mind is thinking, I like this, I don't like that. This is good, this is bad. This is the mind. We have to, this is all illusion. We, we have to overcome the illusions. One should follow in the footsteps of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and engage constantly in chanting the Maha Mantra. In any condition of life, one will be happy if he chants the holy name of the Lord. So we, we saw Maharaj Chitraketu, he was with so many beautiful women, but he was careful to chant the holy name of the Lord. So it's very important to keep the holy name on our tongue in every situation. So Lord Shiva goes on about the nature of the material world and the so-called happiness of the material world. The, the speculative philosopher tries to understand that this material world is false by cultivating knowledge. But this understanding is automatically manifest in the person of a devotee without separate endeavor. The devotee, the, the jnanis, they labor very hard to understand the world is not real. But devotee knows the, the world is temporary, and in this way they're detached from the material world. Automatically comes about by devotional service. So Lord Shiva is glorifying the position of devotees. How these devotees, because they do bhakti, they can understand the real nature of the Lord. They're able to realize the Lord. Other processes, it's not so easy, so difficult. The demigods, they cannot understand the Lord. And these jnanis and yogis, they cannot understand the Lord. But the devotees, because of their bhakti, because of their devotion, they're able to approach the Lord they can understand his identity. And Lord Shiva here, here he describes himself as an ordinary person. So Lord Shiva shows himself also to be very humble. Lord Shiva places himself as one of the non-devotees who cannot understand the identity of the Supreme Lord. The Lord being Ananta has unlimited forms, therefore how is it possible for ordinary men to understand him? Only by devotion he can be understood. 
And then he goes on to describe the, the absolute position of the Supreme Lord, how without devotion nobody can approach him. Now he comes back to Maharaj Chitraketu. He's a dear devotee of the Lord. He's describing the position of Maharaj Chitraketu. And he says, similarly, Lord Shiva says, similarly, I am also very dear to Lord Narayan. Therefore, no one should be astonished to see the activities of the most exalted devotees of Narayan, for they are free from attachment and envy. They are always peaceful. They are equal to everyone. When Chitraketu loudly laughed at my behavior, he did so on friendly terms, and therefore there was no reason to curse him. So Lord Shiva tries to convince Parvati that her cursing of Chitraketu was not sensible. And the Prabhupada writes, Here is a difference between male and female that exists even in the higher statuses of life. Higher status, you couldn't get much higher than Lord Shiva and his wife. But we see here even that Lord Parvati also, she has this problem. Mm -hmm. Lord Shiva could understand Chitraketu very nicely, but Parvati could not. Thus, even in the higher statuses of life, there is a difference between the understanding of a male and that of a female. It may be clearly said that the understanding of a woman is always inferior to the understanding of a man. In the Western countries, there is now agitation to the effect that men and women should be considered equal. But from this verse, it appears that women, a woman is always less intelligent than man. Well, we could say, this only applies to non-devotee women, right? Devotee women, they're not, they have no problem, right? What do you say, ladies? What do you say, men? Do the men agree? Are devotee women also less intelligent or is it only for non-devotee women? who are less intelligent. Hare Krishna Maharaj, devotee women are uh, intelligent because they have taken the path of Krishna consciousness. Okay. So are you saying they're equal to the men? Yeah, in, in, this, in this regard, as for taking the Krishna consciousness, they are also inter equally intelligent uh, as Mm -hmm. So, in, w in what way was Parvati less intelligent? What had she done? The, why? Actually, Parvati, yeah. huh? Parvati also, yeah. She went with little emotion, Maharaj. She's not in, less intelligent, but with emotion because she felt humiliated in front of everyone. So, in that anger she caused, I feel. You correct me, Maharaj, if I'm wrong. In her anger, she became angry. Yeah, with emotions, she... She became emotional. Her. She didn't control her emotions. Okay. Anyway, it's an interesting point which Prabhupada brings up here. It is clear Chitraketu wanted to criticize the behavior of his friend Lord Shiva because Lord Shiva was sitting with his wife on his lap. That, then too, Lord Shiva wanted to criticize Chitraketu for externally posing as a great devotee but being interested in enjoying with the Vidyadari women. They were all friendly jokes. There was nothing serious for which Chitraketu should have been cursed by Parvati. 
upon hearing the instructions of Lord Shiva, Parvati must have been very much ashamed for cursing Chitraketu to become a demon. Mother Parvati could not appreciate Chitraketu's position and therefore she cursed him. But when she understood the instructions of Lord Shiva, she was ashamed. Right? Lord Shiva is pointing out what? What, what did Lord Shiva instruct her? What's the main instruction Lord Shiva has given his wife? To say that he is a devotee, Chetraketu is a devotee, and the devotee of the Lord is on a very higher platform. Yes, certainly he must be a devotee, right? He's up there in the heavenly planets and he's traveling, he's got an airplane given to him by Vishnu and he's traveling with the Vijadari ladies. Certainly he's an elevate, not just any ordinary Kshatriya. Parvati may say, oh, he, he's new to Bhakti. He hasn't been a devotee a long time, just recently became a devotee. She may say like that. But Lord Shiva is pointing out the exalted position of the devotee, that he does have bhakti, he is exalted, and Lord Shiva is appreciating him. And he had revealed his tolerance, he had revealed his spiritual position. You could say, well, Parvati didn't know, she, she didn't know that he was so advanced. But, but that was no reason to curse. Certainly she should have understood that he's a very great personality, that he's able to travel around like that with so, in such, with so much facility. So to curse such an exalted person it was not proper. So what were the faults there then in, the, in, the, in this incident? There, there are faults on both sides. What's the first fault, the initial fault, the cause of everything? Laughing loudly at the Shiva Parvati by Chitraketu Maharaj. Why was he laughing loudly? Proud. No. First fault was that he, Lord Shiva was uh, like Parvati was sitting on the lap of yes, Lord Shiva. Yes, right. That's the first fault. That Lord Shiva is publicly embracing Parvati. There was no sense of uh, propriety, you know, proper behavior, pro moral codes. It's not quite proper <laughs> to see them embracing in public like that. So that was the first. And then what's the second fault? You, you mentioned, right? Chitraketu, what did he do? He took proud. Huh? He laughed, he proud. Yes, he's laughing. So that was not proper either, right? And then after that, then what happens? What's the next fault after that? Parvati cursing uh, Chitraketu. Well, even before, the, you could say the pride, we mentioned also about the pride of Chitra Ketu. And that's, that's probably, the, you could say that's even before he's, he's laughing, that he, he's got this pride, you know, that he, he talks about Lord Shiva and, you know, it's, it's a little bit minimizing his position that Lord Shiva is actually above criticism. So there was some pride there on the part of Chitra Ketu because he, that he did laugh. That was the fault, right? And then something else? Then it would be Parvati's cursing her improper cursing. The un or unnecessary cursing of Chitra Ketu. So we see all these different faults are there, but 
On the other side, what are the merits? What's the merit that we see? Hare Krishna Maharaj, first thing when he laughed, she, Lord Shiva will not react it. With the smile he accepted that. He didn't react. Yes, Lord Shiva didn't react to Chitra Ketu's uh, laughing at him. And after Parvati, Mother Parvati curse, Chitra Ketu also, he uh, um, begged for her forgiveness. Yes. He accepted that curse. Yes, this is... So we see the greatness of the devotees, right? The greatness of the Vaishnavas, that they can tolerate. Oh, Lord Shiva, he, he didn't have much to tolerate. Someone is laughing, oh, you know, not a big... But when somebody curses you to become a demon, that's really you're not so easy to tolerate. So we see the greatness of the devotee, the Vaishnavas, and we see also, ultimately, we see also Krishna's, how Krishna's arranging everything for the ultimate benefit. How Krishna's mercy is arranging for the ultimate salvation of Chitra Ketu, that he can go back to Godhead. Ultimately, it's all the plan of Lord Krishna. So he tolerates all this. So Chitra Ketu, very much ashamed. Oh, in the purport there, 20, uh, 36, uh, Prabhupada quotes Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur describing Parvati, that she feels so ashamed that she, she takes her skirt and covers her face because she's so much ashamed and that she's been wrong in cursing Chitra Ketu. So that great devotee Chitra Ketu was so powerful that he could have counter-cursed her, but he didn't do it. And, and it's stated here, this is very much to be appreciated as the standard behavior of a Vaishnava. Simply bowing and accepting the chastisement, accepting the punishment, accepting the curse. Chitra Ketu very sportingly felt that since the mother wanted to curse him, he, he could accept this curse just to please her. However, when a less intelligent person has some power, he wants to use it for sense gratification. This is not the behavior of a devotee. So we have to understand the proper use. Oh, we see that we see the example, right? Who was it? The improper use of their power. We had that earlier today. It was mentioned. Shringi, Maharaj. Yes, yeah, Shringi. Any other improper use of power? Even Bhasmasara Maharaj. Who? Bhasmasara. He Did... wanted to try his thing on Lord Shiva. Avrukasara, Bhasmasara. Vrikasura. Vrikasura. <laughs> okay. Got... Ashwatama. Ashwa... Ashwatama, the Brahmastra weapon. Yes, good. King, King Vena. King Vena. Yes, King Vena. Oh, yes, very good. Yeah, right. King Vena, he has. He was a Kshatriya, he was killing his friends, killing the other boys who would play with him. Became cruel Venu. Here comes cruel Venu. Yes, okay, so different people, improper use of their powers. The very di Maharaj, uh, Ravana? Ravana also, right? And uh, examples of other devotees accepting the curses? We had many, right? We, had, we already went over that earlier. Devotees, they tolerate the curses. Amrish Maharaj? Yes. All right, so he's going to become Vritasura in his next life. And then the chapter go, comes to a, a finish. If one hears the history of Chitra Ketu from pure devotees, 
their life, their, the listener also is freed from the conditional life of material existence. Anything about devotional service or character of the Lord and his devotees must be heard from a devotee, not from a professional reciter. Milk touched by the lips of a serpent has poisonous effect. So we have to hear in the proper, from the proper source. We're very fortunate to hear from Srila Prabhupada narrating to us this history of Vritasura, of Chitraketu, and how it becomes Vritasura. Okay, so any questions? It's a very wonderful chapter, very instructive, certainly very nice to read it. Any questions, anybody? Anything? No? Okay, so we'll meet on Monday night and we'll go on with chapter 18. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, Prabhu, thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Gorbakta Vrinda Ki. Jai. Hare Krishna.